evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. That's cool. Hello and welcome to Making History. Later in the show we'll visit a small Aegean island off mainland Greece to see a major exhibition in the life and works of famed French artist Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. And trouble in Malaysia. The nation's leading conservationists are up in arms over a government restoration program which they say mars ancient Portuguese ruins in historic Malacca city. Archaeologists have hailed the discovery of prehistoric engravings of animals, hybrid beasts, birds and women at a cave in western France as a major find, with initial estimates putting the vivid engravings at around 28,000 years old. And almost 20,000 people celebrate a festival in the southeastern Turkish village of Kokalan, as they've done for hundreds of years, whipping each other in the name of friendship. But first, to Germany, for an outdoor pageant which commemorates the year 1475, when the Bavarian Duke, Georg the Rich, prepared to marry the Polish king's daughter, Hedwig, in Landshut. The wedding was to be a divine ordinance for the benefit of the empire. For centuries, the Landshut wedding retreated to the history books. But in 1903, a group of Landshut citizens decided to reanimate the pageant with all its colour, pomp and circumstance. The festival was set to be held every four years. For eight days and nights, more than 10,000 wedding guests and 10,000 citizens of Landshut turned out to pay their respects to the dream couple of the Middle Ages. 526 years later, and the streets are just as crowded for the wedding recreation. The dimensions of the original party were phenomenal. 323 oxen, 285 pigs, 1,133 sheep, 11,500 geese and 40,000 chickens were slaughtered to provide a wedding banquet like none other. In addition, the guests consumed 194,345 eggs, 75,000 shrimp, as well as tons of fish and thousands of litres of free beer. Altogether, the celebration cost the bride's family the equivalent of about 25 million German marks in today's terms. Two chroniclers, the Margrave scribe and the convent scribe, both recorded the joyous event in all its glory. So historical details such as the procession route taken by the original wedding party can still be followed accurately today. For three full weeks, festival and dance performances take place in the state room of the town hall. On Saturdays, there's a medieval get-together of costume participants, street theatre and performances in the night camp, complete with jugglers and horsemen. The festival play, also known as Lanshuta Hochzeit, is celebrated on Sunday, followed by the bridal pageant through the town, and finally the tournament of the noble knights in armour brings Europe's largest historical event to a close. 
In 1474, one year before the wedding, ambassadors had been sent to Krakow to negotiate the marriage. And in the fall of 1475, the 18-year-old Princess Hedwig arrived with her entourage after a two-month journey. The bride and groom had never seen each other and needed a translator to overcome the language barrier. According to reports from the time period, the bride cried as she was led out of the stately church of St. Martin, although the chroniclers never reported on whether they were tears of joy or despair. The mightiest lords of the realm attended the royal wedding, among them Emperor Friedrich III and his son Maximilian. Archbishop of Salzburg wed the couple at the majestic church and the Elector of Brandenburg called the festival an act of divine providence to the advantage of Christianity and empire. Around the year 1880, artists from Munich painted scenes of the Landschutter Hochzeit in the state room of the Landschut Town Hall. These frescoes aroused the desire to revive the procession of princes in some of the townspeople. In 1902, they founded the official association and held their first bridal procession in 1903. These days, the three-week-long event attracts over half a million spectators with as many as 2,200 costume participants playing various parts in the reenactment of the procession and now famous wedding ceremony. Greece's Gulandris Museum of Contemporary Art on the island of Andros, far from the Athenian capital, is no stranger to major art exhibitions, including Kodinsky, Henry Moore, Chagall and Picasso. Now the museum has turned its attention to Toulouse-Lautrec, with an extensive showing of 135 works by the artist and a photographic chronology of Lautrec's life, from pictures of the artist painting naked prostitutes the trek at Paris nightclubs and photographs of his aristocratic family. The show is centered around the theme of women, a topic Lautrec had a passion for throughout his life. Works include several authentic lithographs from rare editions belonging to the Gerstenberg collection, one of the most important European private collections, as well as lithographs from other private collectors which have not been on public view for decades. Lautrec was renowned for his obsession with singers, can-can dancers, actresses, divas of the stage and prostitutes. Major works depict the Parisian nightlife during the famous period of the 1890s in Montmartre, now famous throughout the world thanks to films such as Moulin Rouge by Australian director Baz Luhrmann. One popular part of the exhibition is the L series, the drawings of the day-to-day -day lives of prostitutes in brothels where Lautrec often lived for weeks.
Many lithograph prints from the first sketch to the final product are also included, reflecting Lautrec's passion for lithography, which gave him the title as one of the greatest masters of graphic art. The works provide a rare insight into the artist's life, from his pencil sketches to his final paintings. Lautrec, described by art historians as an ugly dwarf, led a physically and psychologically painful life. He suffered from congenital malformation of his bones. Aware of this crippling defect, he constantly sought the company of women and craved their affection. The exhibition was organized to coincide with the 100-year anniversary of the great artist's death. Suffering from alcoholism and syphilis, Toulouse-Lautrec died at the relatively young age of 37. According to Galandra's Foundation President, Fleurette Carondontis, people tend to remember more about the works when they're shown on an island as opposed to the city, while their outlook is often more emotional than critical. Meanwhile in London, one of Monet's famous Haystacks paintings was sold at Sotheby's for £10 million recently. Until now, the elusive masterpiece painted in Normandy in 1890 was known to scholars only through an old black and white illustration. Monet's friend, Paul Gallimard, bought it from the artist the year after it was completed and lent it for exhibition until 1895. It's not been seen in public since then and until recently had never left France. Today it's considered the quintessential Impressionist painting of the 20th century. And while the historical importance of the Haystack series helped raise the price, the record for the most expensive Monet ever sold went to one of the artist's water lily paintings, which fetched 33 million US dollars. Malaysia's ancient port city of Malacca, founded 600 years ago by a Javanese prince, is a world-renowned hodgepodge of old European architecture. The styles reflect the various colonial powers, Portuguese, Dutch and British, that ruled Malacca for over a hundred years each, from the 16th to the mid-20th century. Most of the Portuguese buildings are ruins now, weathered by age and destroyed by successive colonial powers. Despite their historic legacy, some of the ruins are being marred by a government restoration program that only seeks to make the area tourist friendly to attract visitors. Malacca attracts many tourists keen to visit the place touted as the oldest state in Malaysia, which won its independence from the British in 1957. Malaccan conservationists say the restoration program has changed the character of the ruins and destroyed whatever historical value was left behind. The program includes building walkways around the historic Afamosa fortress entrance, built by the Portuguese after they conquered Malacca in 1511. A church on a hill above the fort, first built in 1521 by a grateful Portuguese captain and dedicated as the Church of Our Lady, has had its original volcanic flooring removed and paved with symmetrical rows of tiles. The church was renovated into a two-story building by the Jesuits, led by Portuguese missionary St. Francis Xavier in the 16th century. Conservationists are complaining about the new walkways, cement plastering of old walls and the repainting of tombs without any regard to historical accuracy. Eurasian community elders believe that more research was required before starting a restoration program of this size. They believe the historical outlook has disappeared and the government is clearly at fault. As part of the restoration works, the contractors have uprooted the tombstones from the church floor and laid them up against the walls, which activists say is not historically accurate. Many of the elders have family members buried here, which makes the situation even more difficult. Politician Lim Guan Eng said the Portuguese ruins have now lost their character and all for the sake of a 250,000 US dollar project. Conservationist Josephine Chua goes even further. 
she warned the authorities that restoring the area to make it tourist friendly will destroy its value. According to Chua, changing everything only ensures the loss of valuable history. And even if there were some bad memories associated with colonialism, it shouldn't be covered over with tiles and plaster, but kept as important footnotes of the past. Stunning prehistoric engravings uncovered in a cave in western France could be just a small sample of the treasures held inside its dark and damp interior. Art experts have hailed the find at Cusac in the Dordogne Valley as a major discovery, with the grotto chamber covered in spectacular drawings of wild animals, hybrid beasts, birds and women. Initial estimates have suggested the vivid engravings are between 22,000 and 28,000 years old, while wall paintings in the nearby Lascaux cave complex are reputed to be more than 16,000 years old. Among the artwork is a picture of a bison some four meters long, one of the biggest single prehistoric engravings ever found, and one scene featuring up to 40 figures. Among the line carvings are animals with deformed heads, a bison with a horse's head, silhouettes of women, and half a dozen representations of female erotica. The engravings are dotted along a chamber 900 meters long, some 15 meters wide and more than 10 meters high. The cave itself consists of unstable clay, while the limestone walls are flaky and susceptible to temperature changes, preventing large groups from visiting the chamber. Archaeologists have also found human remains in the cave, although they're not yet sure if the relatively well-preserved skeletons date from a later age than the artwork. The Cusac discovery is the second major prehistoric art site found in France in less than a decade. In 1994, potholers stumbled across a complex of galleries full of animal paintings in the Ardèche Gorge that are believed to be over 32,000 years old. Another unusual archaeological site, soon to be scientifically surveyed, is a Stone Age mound near Stonehenge in Wiltshire. The monolithic mound has been an eye-catching sight in these parts of England ever since it was built around two and a half thousand years BC. Its 37 meter height and flat top led many to believe it concealed an internal burial chamber similar to the Egyptian pyramids. Three major excavations in the last three centuries yielded no evidence of ancient funerals, but those diggings have left the Silbury Hill unstable. The entire structure began to slide in May of 2000, and before a repair and rescue plan could be implemented, a second collapse occurred in December. The collapses gave archaeologists the opportunity to conduct a short dig. They're now examining 600 litres of soil, artefacts and bones removed from the top of Silbury for clues. English Heritage is planning a seismic survey to repair the damage which has already caused some valuable archaeology to be lost from the very top of the mysterious hill. According to Amanda Chadburn, English Heritage Inspector of Ancient Monuments, the work being carried out confirms that Silbury was built in three separate tiers. The top tier shows a solid chalk wall over two metres wide with a chalk and rubble infill. The builders obviously wanted this monument to survive.
Kokkolan village in the southeastern province of Diyarbakir, Turkey, hosts a spring festival each year which attracts almost 20,000 people. The festival, which has been celebrated for 820 years now, begins with the Zikir ceremony, directed by the chief of the ceremony. The men grind their bodies as they listen to the rhythms of tambourines. The festival is organized each year on the last days of spring and the people start to gather early in the morning and stay till sunset. As the music and song intensifies, some of the men enter a trance-like state, ready to whip themselves, or better still, each other, into a frenzy. The most interesting activity practiced on the day is a whipping game, which has been played in these parts for as long as the festival has existed. The bizarre game is played in a circle, where two men meet, whip each other, and then pass their weapons on to other players. The strangest part about this traditional pastime is that it's done in the name of friendship. The whipping game, or karmuchi, is the traditional ceremony of Islamic mysticism along with the practice of repeating the 99 names of God in complete silence. Locals claim there's no way they can hurt each other during the game. They tie some fabric together to make the whips and take special care not to harm their opponents. It's most important to play the game in fun, friendship and peace and not to let it get out of hand. And while the menfolk are whipping up a storm nearby, the women are busy squeezing through a circle in a stone in order to be purified of their sins. Some of them pass through easily, while others occasionally get stuck. And at sunset, the 820th Spring Festival comes to an end. Oh, that's cool.